The second part of our presentation focuses on this concept called situational awareness. I spoke at the outset that situational awareness is a huge topic on its own. Again, many people go to university and study this field of endeavour for many years, but we're just going to have a quick look at situational awareness and emphasise the importance that situational awareness has within the non-towered aerodrome environment. Not just the non-towered aerodrome environment, but even some of our busy towered aerodromes, situational awareness is vital for safe operations. So here's a classic example, Moorabbin Airport, basically the busiest airport in Australia in terms of movements, somewhere up nudging the 350,000 movements a year. What do we have here at Moorabbin? We have five runways, all crisscrossing, and two runways are usually in use at any one time. Busy airspace, many people learning to fly, huge amounts of landings and takeoffs. Situational awareness in an environment like Moorabbin is vital for aviation safety. What I'm going to show you now is a, a video clip from an ATSB investigation of a very close call at Moorabbin Airport, where we see one pilot using really good situational awareness and another pilot where perhaps situational awareness had broken down. So what we have here is a piece of video footage shot out of the right hand seat of a Cessna aircraft. This Cessna aircraft was coming into land on runway 13 right. And as I play this piece of uh, footage, I want you to keep your eye on the top left hand side of the screen as we play it through. So the aircraft is coming down final. Everything is going quite, uh, quite okay. No dramas here. The aircraft comes in over the undershoot and over the piano keys and starts its landing sequence. Have a look at the top left hand side of the screen for me as we go through that footage. And what can you see? An aircraft coming out of nowhere, a Cessna 172, that has punched across a holding point onto an active runway. We'll explain the details as to how this occurred later. But with something like this, let me put it to you. What do you think might have happened next? Well, we have a choice. You could select the 172 to the left might have stopped short, or alternatively, did the aircraft collide on the runway? Or thirdly, maybe the landing aircraft did a go round. So have a think about it, make your choice, and let's see actually what happened in reality. What happened in reality is that the very good situational awareness of the landing aircraft pilot initiated a go round. By using their situational awareness, they managed to avoid what could have potentially been a collision on the runway. That event was a very, very close run thing. Again, we're not here to throw sticks or stones at any of these pilots or to make judgments. What we're here to do is perhaps look at the facts before us and take away some key learnings that we can introduce into our own flying. So, what actually happened? We had two aircraft. The landing aircraft was the pink aircraft on runway 13 right. But the aircraft that encroached across the holding point had landed on runway 13 left, slightly before the pink aircraft. As you can see here, the aircraft on the blue runway had landed and taxied off that runway and had encroached across the holding point, as you can see on the right hand side of that picture. Interviews with the pilots of both aircraft confirmed that one of the reasons why that aircraft punched across the holding point was simply distraction. The aircraft that punched across the holding point had two pilots on board. It was an instructor and a student. And it was simply the fact that they had started their debrief of their lesson while they were still taxiing across all the runways. They weren't perhaps keeping an eye out, therefore missed the holding point and punched across. We need our situational awareness to be top notch, especially when we're flying around busy aerodrome environments. Be they a controlled aerodrome like Moorabbin or Bankstown or Jandicott, or many of the CTAFs around the country. Because remember, at a CTAF, we don't have air traffic controllers. There's not that second pair of eyes that can assist us. There's no one to tell us to line up. There's no one to give us a clearance to take off or clearance to land. In the non-towered aerodrome environment, we as pilots in command, we make those decisions. There's no ATC to help us. So, no video that we produce would be complete without the obligatory cat video. So here's another example of a classic distraction that occurred when we can go flying. 
This I understand occurred in Africa. A couple of people going flying in a light sport home built. Watch the top right hand side of the screen as we see a cat mysteriously appear out of the wing. Cat's quite happy actually, enjoying, enjoying the flight. Comes closer to the edge and just loves the view. Notice how the people haven't seen the cat yet, especially the pilot. But have a good look at his eyes when he actually finally sees the cat. Not really something you'd expect to see when you go flying. Another example of a distraction that can potentially come out of the blue. Have a look at his eyes, he's absolutely shocked. No cat was actually harmed in the filming of that video. The aircraft did manage to come around and land and they removed the cat. Maybe it might have said perhaps something about the robustness of the pilot's pre-flight check, not sighting a cat in a ring. Classic example of distraction. Distractions can come in all sorts of ways. Distraction from ATC, distraction from passengers, distraction even from things like a cat or a piece of wildlife. So, what is situational awareness and how on earth can we improve it when we go flying? I want to break situational awareness down basically into its most simple concept. It's essentially a three step process. The first step is what has happened in the past, what is currently happening now and what's going to happen in the future. We make those decisions when we go flying often instantly without even thinking about it. We use our situational awareness whenever we are consciously awake. When we're driving a car, when we're walking down a set of stairs, when we're making a cup of tea, our brain goes through this three step process often without us even realizing it. And when we go flying, we're doing that exact same three step process. But because when we're going flying, it's a very dynamic environment, isn't it? It's an environment that operates in three dimensions. And therefore, until we build up our experience as aviators, we can have difficulty putting these three steps together. Classic example is that at the moment, I'm teaching my 16 year old daughter how to drive. She's building her situational awareness on the road. So that three step process is certainly happening for her, but it's not as smooth as anyone that might have been driving like myself for over 35 years. Here's a different way of looking at situational awareness. And there are many models out there that can help us describe this concept. Let's have a look at this different model. First of all, we perceive what is out there around us. You might ask, well, how do we perceive things? Well, we use our five senses. Our five senses tell us what's happening in time and space around us whenever we are consciously awake. So first of all, we perceive what's around us. In other words, where is the aircraft? The second step is to comprehend. What does that mean for me? Okay, what is the aircraft actually doing? Is it climbing? Is it descending? Is it in a turn? Am I slowing down? Am I speeding up? Am I to the left of the runway or the right of the runway? The third and final step, or stage three of situational awareness, is to project ahead into the future. In other words, what's going to happen? What's going to happen in the next 15 seconds? What's going to happen when I'm reached a leg of the circuit? What's going to happen in the next hour? Or maybe even for the Qantas pilot flying home from the United States, what's going to happen or what will my aircraft be in in 15 hours time? Where those three things intersect, that's the sweet spot of situational awareness, as you can see in the diagram. So how does that relate then to someone who's an experienced pilot who might have a very well-developed situational awareness versus someone that's perhaps learning to fly? Let's have a look. Situational awareness. Go back to your very first flight, maybe your very first session of circuits where you were probably having a brain overload and struggling to keep up with the aircraft. You had perception, you certainly had comprehension, and you were developing your ability to project. So your situational awareness was still in its infancy, but perhaps when you were doing your first flight, your situational awareness in total, where those three things intersect, was only very small. But a more experienced pilot still does those three things, but the sweet spot's a lot greater. They have a greater grasp on situational awareness. What does that mean? What that means is that with a greater understanding or a greater sense of situational awareness, we can devote more cognitive brain space to working out what else is happening around the aircraft, such as working out where other traffic is, how I'm going to separate myself, dealing with checklists, dealing with passengers and those sorts of things. So 
One of the things I want you to think about when you're watching our video today, reflect on your own flying. What are some of the clues in my own flying that might give me an inkling that perhaps I'm losing situational awareness? And when we talk to most pilots, and myself included, there have been many occasions where we have lost situational awareness. So what are some of these red flags? The first one is ambiguity or even confusion. Classic case, the iPad says that I'm here. However, when I look out of the cockpit, it doesn't match what I'm seeing on my map. Instant loss of situational awareness. Secondly, fixation. That is fixating or concentrating on one thing in the cockpit to the exclusion of everything else. Okay, a dangerous place to be because all our attention, all our cognitive thought processes are devoted to one particular thing and we very quickly lose sight of that bigger picture. Failure to fly the aircraft. This is another big thing. Sometimes we use the adage that too many cooks spoil the broth. In other words, having two pilots on board an aircraft when there isn't a clear division of duties. When we read the accident report and the book about QF32, the A380 that blew up its engine over Singapore. There was a lot of experience on that flight deck. When that event occurred, there were ICAS messages going off, there were alarms and bells and all sorts of things happening in that cockpit. But one of the first things the crew did was that they nominated one particular person to fly the aircraft and let everyone else deal with the emergency and run the checklists. Fourthly, failure to look outside. And you might think to yourself, well, surely that's just a given. But perhaps think back to our initial scenario at Port Macquarie with the Foxbat pilot. Maybe a more disciplined lookout might have saved the day. The AOPA, or the Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association in the United States, did some research, I understand, recently where they hooked up VFR pilots with various biometric sensors where they could track where their eyes were looking on a typical VFR flight they found most pilots on a typical VFR flight had their head inside the cockpit over 50% of the time because there's lots of things to distract us in the cockpit. There's all our instruments, there's passengers, there's our iPads, there's all sorts of electronic flight instruments which are very attractive and can, and can attract the eye. So failure to look outside's a big one. Maybe even back to our Moorabbin example where the aircraft taxied across the holding point. Failure to meet estimated times of arrival. Failure to meet things like targets or speeds or altitudes will also give you an instant loss of situational awareness. So will failure to fly our aircraft within limitations or even the regs. What regulations do or what limitations do that we might find, for example, in the flight manual is it provides us as pilots with a frame of reference within which to operate. We go outside that frame of reference and we are really in uncharted territory especially when it comes to things like our flight envelope and things like center of gravity. When we fly outside those limits in our flight manual, well then congratulations because we've just become test pilots. Because Mr. Cessna and Mr. Piper and Mr. Beechcraft, they wash their hands. You operate outside those limits, you are essentially on your own. We don't know how the aircraft is going to handle or how the aircraft is going to react. And finally, and we've spoken about this in our previous talk about communication, Failure to communicate effectively. If our language is vague, if the information we're giving is incomplete, or if there's too much information. All of these things should be red flags or identify with us as clues that perhaps our situational awareness is starting to deteriorate. So when we next go flying, have a think about these things, how we perhaps react to them, and let those be little triggers in our mind that perhaps our situational awareness is starting to reduce. How can we improve our situational awareness when we go flying? There are things we can do. First of all, we have this saying, if it feels wrong, it probably is. You're never going to find this rule or that statement in any regulation or anywhere in rules that we publish, but it's that old gut instinct. And especially if you've been flying for quite a while and have sufficient experience, it's amazing how accurate that gut instinct is. And I'm sure most of us have either been flying or driving or been in any other part of our life and we get that feeling, that inner sense that something isn't just quite right. It's amazing how accurate that can be. Secondly, a sterile cockpit rule. 
the airlines and the military are very hot on things like sterile cockpit. All that really means is, especially for the airlines, is that from basically pushback to departure and climb through about 10,000 feet, the only conversation on the flight deck is operational conversation only. We don't talk about the footy scores or what we're doing on Saturday night. And the same on descent. From about 10,000 feet until we're at the gate, again, operationally relevant conversation. Why? Because that's the busy part of the flight where distraction has the potential to reduce our situational awareness. Now, I'm not saying that we have to establish a sterile cockpit rule for our own private or recreational flying, but you might want to think about perhaps asking your passengers that perhaps when we're in the circuit area, just keep the volume of our conversation down or even just stay quiet unless you see something that I need to be aware of. Again, just in the circuit area or in those very busy phases of flight. Thirdly, Fly within our personal limits. It might be personal limits with regards to visibility or other weather related phenomena. It could be personal limits with regards to the way the aircraft handles, such as crosswind limits. We go outside those personal limits. Again, we do run the risk of losing our situational awareness because we could potentially find ourselves in an environment that we're not used to, okay? Personal limits do play a large factor, especially for a lot of pilots that might not fly that regularly, whose experience levels or recency levels might not be fully as developed as people that might fly every week. Learn to recognise those red flags. We spoke about them on the previous slide. We each might react to those red flags differently, but think about our own flying. Think about the previous flights that we've flown. Even when we've landed after a flight, just spend some time thinking about the flight we've just completed. Was there any little red flag on that flight that could have potentially led me to a reduction of situational awareness? And finally, that old adage, prioritise what we do in the cockpit. We aviate first, we fly the aircraft first. Then we navigate and be aware of our position and where we're going. And finally, in order, we communicate our intentions. We go back to those old lessons that still hold true today.